Well, good evening, folks. This is Joshua Tomlin, and I'd like to welcome you to the program today. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to stop, tune in, listen to the radio. Maybe you're on the Internet. Maybe you're somewhere close here to the Boyle County area. You could be on the complete other side of the world, but wherever you are, I believe that we're serving the same God. The same God that's here is the same God that's there. If you're uh, if you're a Christian, and you can be happy in your salvation just as I am, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful that we can all be family together as children of God. Going to get right into the message today. We're going to look at Acts chapter 17 in verse 16, and uh, Paul the apostle here. He's he's gone to Athens in Greece, and he is waiting for. Uh, Timotheus and Silas to come to him, and so he's there in Athens, and uh, Acts seventeen sixteen says this, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, there's some powerful verses within this chapter that I'd like to bring out and touch on today. And Lord, we thank you. We just came through the season of Thanksgiving, and we're going to touch on some of that today. And we thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings, things that we forget to thank you for, for life, for health, strength. Lord, maybe times you've protected us, things you've done for us that we knew nothing about. We were never aware of it, but you did it anyway. And God, we praise you for that. We thank you, and we give all the glory to you because you're the only one that deserves any glory. Lord, we want to give honor where it's due. And And, Lord, you're the only one that's deserving of any glory or praise, so we give it all to you. Thank you again, Father. Encourage someone out there today. Draw them close to you. Lord, save that one that's closest to hell. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, I'm going to read quite a bit more here in this chapter. There's a lot of verses, and I'm going to try to get through it the best I can. But it says, uh, let's start there at verse 16 again of Acts chapter 17. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth any thing, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now, I know that's a lot of reading, but there's some great, great truths. You know, we just came, as I mentioned in the prayer, through Thanksgiving season. 
And, of course, as Christians, we know we're supposed to be thankful all the time. But here in November, we kind of have a time that we set aside where we get together with our family and friends, and we pray, we eat some good food, and I've eaten too much, I can tell you that already. But it's this time that we set aside to be thankful. And there were some things that I noticed. I began to walk around in some stores and and see some commercials here and there, and I would see signs, even in secular places of business, about being thankful. And in these commercials, they're talking about thankfulness and giving thanks and the Thanksgiving season and gratitude. And as a Christian, that makes sense to me because, you know, we're supposed to give praise and honor and glory to God. That's what Thanksgiving is all about, being thankful to God for our blessings, for how bountifully he's blessed us. But I began to realize, you know, these are secular businesses and and people that may not even believe in God with these big advertising campaigns. And it makes me wonder, who are they being thankful to? Who are they talking about? What what is this thankfulness that they feel? Who is that directed to? It's reminded me again of that that verse where the uh, Athenians there in Greece, they made that inscription that said, to the unknown God. You see, they like to talk about religion. They like to talk about philosophy. They like to talk about all these things. They loved it. They lived for that. There at Mars Hill was a place that they would discuss all these things, and they would debate philosophy and religion back and forth. And that's just like the world is today. You'll hear celebrities or politicians even talk about God, and you wonder the same thing. Who are they talking about? Who who are they being thankful to? Who are they... Uh, extending their praise to. Because a lot of people, they don't have a problem with God. They don't have a problem with religion. Just like those in Athens, they love to talk about religion and philosophy. But it's when you mention the name of Jesus that people begin to get uncomfortable. See, if we want to be an effective witness in the world today, we're going to have to address this world just like Paul addressed those in Athens. We're going to have to muddle through all this philosophy and religion, get that out of the way, and begin to preach Jesus. Those verses said that those Athenians had never heard anything like this before. And it can't be just where we go to somebody and say, you know, you need to be saved. You need to accept Jesus in your heart. You need to be saved from your sins because they don't have that foundation. For a lot of us that are raised in a Christian home or have been going to church or reading our Bibles for a while, we have these, this lingo that we have this jargon that we use, and we understand it, but the world around us doesn't. We take for granted that everybody knows who Jesus is, and that's just not the case. If we're going to be an effective witness, we're going to have to do some explaining. Just like Paul did, we're going to have to come and and say, first of all, there is a God, this one that you're talking about, this one that you talk about being thankful to, this one that you mention, and, and some people think, oh, it's just a higher power, or just this or that. We have to begin to explain who that is. We have to start at the very beginning and say, God created all this that we see. And we have to go through and explain, why do we need a Savior? Well, it's because of Adam's sin in the garden. And because we're human and we've inherited that sin nature, we have to go through all of this and explain. That's what we have to do if we want to be an effective witness. And once we lay the foundation, then, and only then, can we begin to preach and teach Jesus to them. And we can begin to tell them why they need to be saved from their sins and how they can go about that. And I'll be the first to say it's not easy. And in fact, in these scriptures, we notice that there weren't thousands upon thousands of people who followed after Paul. You know, a lot of people, I've even heard some preachers or some people try to say that Paul wasn't as good a preacher as Peter was because we read once where Peter preached to a crowd and there were 3,000 converts, but when Paul preached... There were just a few. Well, there's a reason for that. Peter was preaching to the Jews on earlier in the book of Acts, and these Jews already had the foundation. They knew who God was. They knew the story of creation. They knew about Adam's sin. They knew about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They had all that history. So all Peter had to do was build on the foundation that was already there. But those that were in Greece, there in Athens, they knew nothing. They had no idea about this. They didn't understand it. They didn't have the foundation upon which to build. So Paul had to start from the ground up. His job was a whole lot harder. 
And I feel like that's what we're facing in the world today. We're having to start from the ground up when we witness to people because they aren't being taught anymore. They aren't being taught in school. And unfortunately, even a lot of churches aren't teaching this anymore. Those that go to church all their lives, even some of them haven't heard this. So we need to realize that we can't get discouraged. Paul just had a few converts here. Just a couple were named and said there were just a few others with him. And uh, people aren't always going to respond positively to our witness. It's just a fact. They're not always going to respond positively. But we have to remember, it's not our job to convert. Pay close attention to that. It's not our job to convert. It's our job to tell. If there's any converting to be done, it'll be God that does it, working through old-time Holy Ghost conviction. And what we need to do is be prayed up, studied up, read up, and we need to know enough that we would be able to tell, that we'd be able to give a reason for the hope that's within us. That's what we need to do to be an effective witness. Well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for these verses that we read today. Hopefully folks were encouraged. And God, I'm praying right now that we as Christians, those of us that are Christians and have trusted in your name, that we will learn better how to be an effective witness that we won't go just spewing a bunch of philosophy and religious jargon, but that we'll actually get in the Word of God and we'll begin to show and tell people how and why they need to be saved and build that foundation. God, thank you for your great plan of salvation. We know that there's no other way that we can come to you but through Jesus. Again, Father, save that one that may be under the sound of my voice right now that is under conviction. Lord, I pray you would send conviction and that they would... Lord, turn to you, realize you're their only hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We thank you again for tuning in to the program this evening. Join us again next week, 645. We'll be right back here with another message. Have a great week, and may the Lord richly bless you.